Welcome to Urban U, everyone. I'm Abby Ashola. And I'm Ari Goldberg. This month, we are filming from Gutman Community College, right here in the heart of the city, just across the street from gorgeous Bryant Park. And as always, we've got some great CUNY stories for you. We'll tell you about a unique bookstore in Brooklyn, a CUNY wheelchair basketball team, and how CUNY is helping to rebuild New York's oyster reefs. But first... New York is one of the film capitals of the world, and the very first documentary film school in the entire country was founded right here at CUNY, at City College. Dave Davidson's new documentary, Cinema and Sanctuary, traces this bit of rediscovered cinema history. When I came here in 1986, um, I was aware of Hans Richter from my own undergraduate studies at the University of Illinois, and his experimental films blew me away and turned me towards film. Uh, but when I got here, it took a while, but I heard that Richter had taught here in some capacity. So I knew I was walking on sacred ground at that point, but where, how, why? It took me a number of years of digging to sort of find out about the Institute because it was the, one of those best kept secrets. That best kept secret is the Institute of Film Technique at City College. The subject of filmmaker Dave Davidson's new documentary, Cinema and Sanctuary, the story of America's first documentary film school under the guidance of Hans Richter. It was founded in 1941, not by Hans Richter, but by Irving Jacoby, who was a graduate, and he recognized that America was behind in making documentary, informational, and even, I could say, propaganda films that would push back against the films that the Nazis been, had been making since the 1930s. So by the spring of 1941, the film school was launched, and it really was the first of its kind in that it was a college-level, organized series of courses focused completely on documentary. The national emergency, with its urgent problems in public information, morale, and civilian instruction, has emphasized the need for persons trained in the making and use of films for these purposes. The Institute of Film Techniques at the City College of New York. However, it took a very fortuitous discovery while renovating an old campus building for Davidson's digging to really pick up steam. And as they were starting to bust it up, somebody went into a closet, opened it up, and found a box of old films. And those old films were films that were made at the Institute. So there, suddenly, the light bulb goes on. It's like, wow, we could do a film here. So I started putting things together. As a campus, we had certainly forgotten about it. Um, as someone who's worked at City College for 28 years, I'd heard nothing about it. And it was electrifying. The Institute for Film Technique at City College was the place where European-style documentary and art film was introduced in the United States. So it was, it was a radically different set of film techniques uh, and really sparked the imagination of a whole new generation of filmmakers. When uh, Jacoby was called to the Office of War Information in 1943, he looked inward to find his successor, and the person he chose was Hans Richter. And Richter was one of those European expats who had an illustrious history in Europe before he was run out of Germany by the Nazis, but he was a founding experimental filmmaker. It was like a bomb exploding at City College when Hans Richter uh, arrived. Indeed, that bomb would have lasting impact long after the Institute's wartime beginnings. A-listers like Woody Allen and Stanley Kubrick attended the film school, as well as influential experimental and independent filmmakers like Jonas Mekas and Shirley Clark. All of them, and more, were drawn into Richter's gravitational pull. It was natural for him to come to City College. Back in the 30s, City College was also a hotbed of anti-fascism in terms of the student body. They were all very left-leaning, so in the 30s they were really active. And while the original Film Institute of Davidson's documentary would shudder in 1966, the current film studies program at City College is certainly still grounded in its student activist roots. The film programs that we have today at City College carry on Hans Richter's legacy. City College has always been an affordable, accessible institution. These are stories that come out of their own experience and are telling stories about what America looks like and feels like now and the direction that America is going. And so we become 
the place that continues to encourage that kind of storytelling and give voice to these informed and sensitive folks whose stories need to be heard. But you'll also be surrounded by other students and faculty members who've really made a commitment to telling stories that don't get told anyplace else. And that's why film study at City College is important. From the campus of City College, in many ways the birthplace of the American Documentary Film School, I'm Ari Goldberg for Urban U. After Kalima D'Souza earned two master's degrees at two CUNY schools and landed the job she wanted at CUNY Silberman School of Social Work, she decided to add entrepreneur to her list of accomplishments. I spoke to her about what inspired her to create Brooklyn's very first feminist bookstore. I believe that women, we cannot afford to have just one career, and we cannot afford to just have a career that we may not be in love with. Our sense of joy needs to exist, mm -hmm. and sometimes that means creating what you want to see in the world and creating your oasis. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. My name is Kalima Tessuz, and I'm the owner of Café con Libros, the only feminist bookstore in Brooklyn. Along with her dream job at CUNY's Silberman School of Social Work, Tessuz finds her joy in this groundbreaking space she created in Crown Heights. So what inspired you to open a bookstore in Brooklyn mm, catered to women, feminist women? Uh, yeah, black feminism, I literally saved my life, you know? I think, um, it's really hard to grow up as a black woman in America. It's hard to grow up as a dark-skinned, melanated black woman. Hello. Yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. Who has one foot in one world and one foot in another world. So growing up ethnically Panamanian and being treated as just black in America. And, and so having to sort of navigate what does it mean for me to be black, yes, and for me to be Panamanian and have my that, that be my primary sort of identity on some levels. People like Bell Hooks, Toni Morrison, who I told you about before, my most favorite book is um, The Bluest Eye. By Mine Tony. too. Oh my God. Mine too. Mm -hmm. Mine too. Published in 1970, The Bluest Eye is the first novel written by Nobel Prize winning author Toni Morrison. The story challenges society's Eurocentric beauty standards through its main character, Picola Breedlove, a young dark skinned girl who prays for blue eyes taught me that I didn't need anybody to tell me that I loved me, that they loved me, that I needed to be able to do that for myself mm -hmm. and have been on that journey ever since. And I wanted to sort of provide that same thing for other young girls um, and women and folks who are just maybe not even struggling, but just want to be amongst powerful, powerful women all the time. Absolutely. And so be surrounded by books that is just about women. So far, D'Souza has made Café Con Libros available to various creatives looking to curate events. Her personal favorite is the store's very own book club. We meet every second Sunday of the month from 1 to 3 p.m. And we only read books from women, by women, for women, and about women's stories. And it's just a place where we just get to be smart and human and just connect. We know Amazon has kind of taken oh, over geez. the whole book industry. Yeah but things kind of seem like they're shifting back. The shift in the culture, is there a shift in your eyes? I think there is a shift in the culture. It's like sort of political and economic mm. in that we are very clear that we need to put our money where our mouths are. And so Absolutely. buying local and supporting black owned, woman owned, POC owned businesses is a, is a political act against capitalism that does not necessarily support businesses of color. So when it's all said and done, what do you wish that people would say Cafe Con Libros did for them? Oh my gosh, I, my prayer is that they feel first and foremost, foremost um, affirmed when they walk in the door. You can't be what you can't see. And so I just want folks to be able to come in and see all that they can be. Especially young girls, there is no limits on what you can be, right? Like, and if you need to see it, step in here. Thank you, Kalima. Thank you. <laughs> Abby Ashola for Urban U. Baruch College Assistant Professor Stephen Gosnell works with a nonprofit called the Billion Oyster Project, which helps rebuild oyster reefs which once filled New York's harbors. Donna Hanover spoke with Professor Gosnell about how he helps keep oysters surviving in the wild and also showing his students some exciting careers in science. New York's Harbor is a giant lab for Baruch College assistant professor, Dr. Stephen Gosnell. He studies oysters, which clump together in the wild, creating large reefs that attract different species of fish and are valuable in other ways as well. 
They prevent erosion. They actually act as a wave break for storms that are coming in and help reduce those impacts. They help filter the water so the oysters feed by bringing the water in and they can cleanse the water that way. As they do that, they produce waste, and that waste actually acts like a fertilizer for sediment microbes. So these microbes that are in the sediment around them and in and on their shells can actually help remove nitrogen from the water columns. The problem is, while New York's harbor once had 200,000 acres of oyster reefs, they are long gone. Gosno works with the nonprofit Billion Oyster Project based on Governor's Island to bring the reefs back. BOP Executive Director Pete Malinowski explains how we lost all the oysters. So they were consumed by rich and poor alike in New York City, sold from carts, and also packed into barrels, salted, and shipped all over the world. After we ate all the oysters, farmers actually imported seed oysters from points south in the Delaware Bay and the Chesapeake Bay and brought them up to plant on New York Harbor beds. And that worked until the completion of the aqueduct. And then New Yorkers had as much water as they wanted, and so they took as many showers and flushed as many toilets. And, it, and all of that wastewater went right out into the rivers. People started getting sick, and then by the early um, sort of 1900s, they closed all of the shellfish beds. In its lab, the BOP creates the right conditions for oysters to have babies in tanks. They also collect oyster shells from restaurants, dry them out for about a year, and bag them to put in the tanks. Each baby attaches to a shell as an adoptive home, and then batches of them are installed in the harbor to start reefs. Aided by CUNY students and alums like Matthias Tong and Jennifer Zhu, Gosnell researches how to give oysters the best chance of surviving so the reef projects succeed. So there's a difference between growing these oysters for aquaculture, where you want them to grow fast, you want them to be tasty, and you really want to eat them. As opposed to when you put them out on the Hudson, you need them to be able to live for a number of years and eventually have their own babies and reproduce and add to the population. That means adding stressors in the hatchery process, like varying temperature or salinity, or even having the young oysters live right near their natural predators. The oyster drills are one of the main predators in this area. They're these little tiny snails, and they actually come up and get attached to the oysters, and they drill a hole straight through them. That's why it's called an oyster drill. What we're using is something called sublethal cues. So basically the idea is that you can put the predator near the oyster, and the way to think about it is the oysters can smell them or sense their chemical cues that they release. And because of that, the oysters have been shown to actually grow differently. Well, they, again, that'd be thicker shells, or different growth patterns, and that may help them survive in the wild. Oysters for this research are kept in mesh cages attached to piers and then brought in to have their progress checked. These are oysters in here. These are baby oysters. I can rinse them out for you to see. The snail-like ones are, are the, the predators. Yep, they're the predators. I just make sure that my um, predators are alive, um, first and foremost, because we want to keep them alive and happy and scaring the oysters. The oysters are measured often. We get their mass, right, with, with what we use with the scale. We get their growth and we get their length. Dr. Gosnell also helps high school students at the New York Harbor School as they work with the BOP. Kevin, you put one of the blue ones over? Yeah. Did you guys sometimes think a little teeny oyster? What kind of difference could that make? Well, before coming to Harbor School, I didn't really understand what a dif uh, the difference an oyster could make. But now knowing that a, one teeny tiny oyster can filter 50 gallons of water a day each, then one billion could filter so many more. Gosnell even shared recently in a two and a half million dollar National Science Foundation grant to boost student involvement. Meanwhile, rebuilding the oyster reefs will take many years, but it is underway. And BOP hatchery manager Rebecca Resner says everyone is welcome to help. You can come to the island, sign up on our website, um, volunteer, and do many different kinds of tasks. We also have a citizen scientist program um, where people will have ORS cages, so oyster research stations, and they can take data and give it back to us. Scientists like Baruch's Dr. Stephen Gosnell feel that their work rebuilding oyster reefs is all the more urgent because climate change is making storms and storm surge all the more violent. It's kind of amazing that that small little shellfish might hold part of the answer to protecting New York. I'm Donna Hanover for Urban U. Gutman is all about experiential education. The college fosters this philosophy through its free study abroad program called Global Gutman, which allows students to travel to places like London, China, Belize, and Ecuador. 
We have a few photos to tease you with today, and we'll have more on an upcoming episode. There are over 174 languages spoken at CUNY, and of course, along with that comes a mix of cultures and traditions, which make our city all the richer for it. One of those traditions is getting passed on and preserved at a center in Flushing from some of our graduates and students from Queens College. Susan Jun has that story. Modern Korean music and dance captivate with K-pop, the South Korean pop music scene which has become a global sensation. And while many Korean Americans get caught up in the excitement of K-pop, some choose to look to ancient times to keep old traditions alive. Dating back 5,000 years to the Gojoseon Kingdom, traditional Korean dance is a study in controlled and precise movements. A far cry from the look and sound of the current craze of K-pop. Still, there is a link between present and past in the precision of the choreography and the dramatic expression through music and dance, which has long been part of Korea's cultural heritage. It is all started from like shamanic rituals and Buddhism rituals, which uh, has developed different style of dancing, preserving uh, the beauty of the Korean dancing. Donning customary Korean silk dresses called hanbok, dancers practice the ancient art form that's kept alive at the Korean Traditional Music and Dance Center in Flushing, Queens. I've been living here um, 42 years, yeah, more than I live in Korea, so I want to connect through this dance. One, two, three, and four. Heels together, heels together. Director of the center, Yu Sung Kang, teaches a hybrid of traditional and modern dances, constantly coming up with new creations while maintaining the core of ancient Korean dance. The lines that we are creating is very curved, not straight too much. Everything has to be like, you know, inside, inward, and don't express too much. Um, it has to be in you, but you have to express a little by little. That means you are rele releasing your um, joy and sadness, whatever that is in you. Keep breathing. It requires your entire body. It's not just outside of my body, but also inside. Yeah, and it's very fascinating to learn, you know, how clever our ancestor was. The rich history of ancient Korea is conveyed through the dances of the royal court, as seen in the striking fan dance and felt in the rhythmic folk music of the traditional Korean drums. An award-winning dancer and Queens College graduate, Kang was exposed to performance from a young age, watching her mother, Yoon Suk Park, an accomplished and award-winning artist, perform Pansori, Korean opera, and the Kayakum, a traditional Korean stringed instrument developed in the 6th century. Park established the Korean Traditional Music and Dance Center in 1987 after coming to the U.S. from South Korea, hoping to spread awareness and appreciation for ancient Korean arts. I think it's really important to keep up the old, old traditions. Without the old tradition, there's no new ones. A concept that's not lost on the younger generation. Jiwon Choi, a senior at Queens College, has been playing the traditional Korean drums since the age of eight. But I just really wanted to just embrace my culture 
and my origins and my roots, of Korean roots. For NYU junior Hannah Kim, it's not as much about embracing her roots as it is about discovering them. As a Korean American living and born in the United States, I feel like it's really hard to connect with your culture. And so I feel like an organization like this really immerses me and exposes me to the culture that I've never known and seen. Kim, along with the rest of the center students, share that culture by performing at community events. Over the past three decades, the organization has sought to spread and preserve traditional Korean culture with thousands of performances throughout the tri-state area. And in connecting the past with the present, the future is not forgotten. At the center's second studio on Long Island, there's a keen focus on teaching the very young, many of whom are second and third generation Korean Americans. Looking at and to the future, Kang hopes someday to open a Korean cultural school. I think it's really important for me to spread it and um, teaching it passed on to my, the next generations. I'm Susan Jun for Urban U. Did you know CUNY has a wheelchair basketball team? All-star Ryan Martin will lead this first ever varsity team on the Eastern Seaboard. We're thrilled to share their story. Just tremendously pleased with how things have come together uh, with the three clinics that we've done in three different boroughs at three different CUNY schools. Then bringing Ryan Martin aboard has been the game changer. So for us, it's been uh, generating student interest in our campuses, seeing the reaction of our, of our coalition of students with disabilities and the general CUNY family. And then when Ryan Martin came on board, that really changed everything because his thinking and his vision takes us to another level. And that's what we wanted in bringing Ryan Martin on board because you know, we know how to do athletics. He does inclusive athletics like no one else. We have a history of having like a lot of really great wheelchair athletes, you know, whether it's in the wheelchair basketball space, track and field and tennis, and often they have to jump on a plane, you know, and basically say, hey, I'm gonna be a student athlete at another institution, you know, thousands of miles away from my family. But the reality is like they can stay close to home get that high high level of education that they want. It's just been an awesome process, right, to see the potential and understand, like, you know, how how vast of an institution CUNY is and, you know, the raw numbers that are available with students with disabilities currently on campus, but also taking a look at demographically in our region and seeing what's possible for, you know, uh, prospective student athletes. When they told me, I was shocked um, because Basically, I was the voice, and I was happy that my voice was heard. And even if it wasn't going to be heard, I was going to make sure it was heard. So I will be coming back since I have graduated from Hostel. Any games, anything, I would like to be informed so I can come. Um, because it all started with me. And, you know, I'm just excited because if I would have never opened that door, we would not have something like this today. Destiny is an amazing young lady. Um, her, her energy just around the Hostos community, um, everyone just finds a way to sort of just attach themselves to her. So when she naturally came up to us and just uh, wanted to, uh, you know, start a wheelchair basketball program, um, without a doubt, I was gonna do whatever we could to help her. We mapped it out uh, as a blueprint and to see it uh, bear fruit today, having uh, many of New York City's top uh, high school players, um, remarkable wheelchair athletes who have graduated high school but are considering returning to CUNY for ongoing education and professional readiness and having all of them keeping an open mind and heart about uh, and seriously considering the, the opportunity to come here to compete under the CUNY banner at the highest level. CUNY on three, one, two, three, CUNY! Good job, guys. Well, that is our show for this month. For more information on any of our stories, check out our webpage, tv.cuny.edu, or our Urban U Facebook page. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Now.